Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're going to talk about retopology. This is a fairly in-depth, detailed guide. I'll be talking about why we retopologize and how we set up ready for retopology. And in the next episode, I'll be talking about the actual retopology technique in terms of how to separate out your polygons and the topology flow. Do check out the links in the description and my website and the playlists on my channel for more free courses. Also, if you like what I do, then you can check out my new character course. It takes you right from nothing through to making a great game character. Okay, so first of all, what is retopology? Well, we've got this very high poly mesh. It's actually 4 million triangles, as we can see up there. Incidentally, you can get your statistics under the overlays and just tick the statistics box just here. So 4 million triangles will obviously not work in a game. It's hard enough for 3D programs to show that in the viewport, let alone trying to animate this or put it into a game with other detailed objects. So somehow we need to reduce the polygon count down to something far more manageable. In order to do that, we retopologize. Now there's different methods of doing this. There's add-ons you can get that help the process and speed things up. There's automated processes, but they tend to do a very sort of rough job. And there's even modifiers within Blender that do an extremely rough job, but they can be useful if your objective is not to go into a game engine and not to optimize it fully. For example, if you just wanted to paint your dragon, at the moment we can't because the unwrap process would take far too long and it would lag a lot when painting because we've got 4 million triangles. So we still need to retopologize, but we don't need to go extremely optimized just for painting. We could get away with a reasonably high poly count and use one of these sort of rough automated tools. And you can use things like the decimate modifier and the remesh options. But if we want to optimize, then we have to manually trace over our object. What we end up with is if I click on my retopo that I've done and hide the detailed, you can see this retopoed version here. And if I select that and go into edit mode, you can see we've got three and a half thousand triangles, which is greatly reduced and this will be fine in a game engine or similar. This will also help greatly when we come to painting our objects because it's much easier to unwrap. If you do one of the automated processes, then you'll probably end up using the automated unwrapping processes and they can be a little bit glitchy with high poly meshes. So this is good all round. Now you might say we've lost a lot of detail. And if I hide this and bring our dragon back, you can see all these fine details, which we obviously haven't got in the retopo version. Well, the process then is to bake the information from the high poly onto the low poly in the form of a texture. We use both a normal map, which is the sort of bumpiness, and we use what's often called a cavity map, which highlights all the cavities and helps us with our shading when we come to paint it. And I'll talk more about those sort of things in later episodes of this small series. Now, if you want to know more about these sort of things, then I've got a useful video about making great models for film and video games, which gives an overview of the whole process of making models and the stages you go through. So make sure you've checked that out. So to start off with, we need a new object because our retopology is on a completely separate object and it sticks to the original object using snapping and modifiers. Also, it's worth pointing out that my center point for my dragon is right in the center of the scene. I think that's a useful thing to do. It just makes everything easier to align, especially when you're using things like mirrored objects, which this is, so we'll be mirroring our retopology object. So we'll only have to retopologize one half. So I'll shift right click onto an area where I'll start the retopology. So just here, shift A to add and add in a plane. And I'll scale that down and just reposition it so it's on the outside. So R to rotate and rotate just like this as well. Okay, so it's sticking out on top of my dragon. Now I'm going to shift S, cursor to world origin, and then right click, set the origin to the 3D cursor. That way when I mirror it, it will be around this center point here. So I'll add the mirror now. So add modifier, mirror modifier, and it's not working at the moment because of the rotation I've added to it. So let's press N. You can see there's some rotation there. If I press control A and then rotation, it flips the other side because now it's all set at zero. So we're now ready to build this side of our dragon. So I'll minimize that mirror for the moment and I'm going to go into edit mode, ready to edit our shape. Now there's a couple of things we need to do. First of all, we need to make sure snapping is turned on. So this magnet here needs to be highlighted and then with the drop down box, we need to change that to face. So to put it simply, snapping is where we take an object and it snaps or sticks to another object. In this case, it's going to stick to any faces. So if I just have that selected, 
and I'll take off any options for the moment. If I press G to grab, you can see the middle center point is snapping to any face that it meets. And you can see the other side moving as well. But we've got a slight problem that it's underlapping the surface here. I'm in face mode, so I'm moving about just this face. This will be the same if I'm in vertex mode and they're all selected and I press G to grab. It takes the center point and snaps that to the faces. However, if I come to this drop down and say project individual elements and tick that and press G to grab, now with those vertices selected, you can see that they're all sticking to the faces individually. So it's important to have that project individual elements ticked. The other thing that's quite interesting is line rotation to target. If I take off project individual elements and tick that, you'll see that when I press G to grab, it inserts itself inside the object, but you can see that point coming out. So it's aligning itself to the rotation or the normals of the face that it's sticking to. And that can also be useful. However, with project individual elements as well, if I tick that and start moving it around, that doesn't seem to work. That's because these individual elements are sticking to the targets. So the rotation of this plane doesn't actually come into effect because the rotation of the plane will be dependent on where these four vertices stick. I can't think of any situations at the moment where a line rotation to target will override project individual elements. So it doesn't really make any difference if you have this ticked whilst this one's ticked. But I could be wrong, maybe there's someone out there who knows more than I do. So to put it simply, we turn snapping on, make sure faces enable and project individual elements so they all stick on the surface of our object. Okay, so once we do that, we can start grabbing and maybe scale this down a touch. I'm probably going to retopologize to around this sort of size and we can start adding elements. So if I go to edge mode now and choose this edge, I can control right click and create edges going along here. Now there is a slight issue here. My new mesh is going inside the old mesh. And whilst it is possible to keep modeling like that and build up your shape like this, there is a modifier that will help us to lift it above the other mesh. If we go across the add modifiers and we go to the shrink wrap modifier, which is in the middle of the deform and click on that, this is a clever modifier which will take your shape and shrink wrap it so stick to or cover the surface of another mesh. So if I choose the target as the dragon's head, so I'll click on the picker, choose the dragon's head. You can see a tiny bit of movement there, but not much. There's a snapping mode on surface and we need to change that to outside surface to make sure it's on the outside and we can change the offset. Just push that up just a touch and you can see it's moving away and sticking to the top of my surface. So I can actually see my mesh on top of the dragon. Now it's a bit tricky to try and edit like this because our mesh is actually stuck here and this is the result of the modifier, but the original is right on top of the surface. So if we choose this option here, which is on cage, so we see our editable mesh, the mesh underneath on top of the result of the modifier. So that's a bit easier if we've got that on cage option enabled. So now we are ready for some retopology. Okay, so that's the basics of how we set up for retopology. In the next video, we'll be talking about techniques of retopology, where to put our mesh. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.